Rev up your engine! Here we have a beautiful 2002 Corvette. And guess what? It isn't owned by a guy. A lady owns it. You fell in love with a car, but especially the blue paint. She may live in Tennessee. She drove all the way to Georgia to pick this one up. Now you might think I can't afford a car like this. Well, yeah, when it was new, it was about 50 grand. She got this beauty the way it looks now for $16,000. Now it's got 81,000 miles on it now, but she bought it with only 65,000 miles on it. And you might say, oh, it's an old sports car. You can spend a fortune fixing it up. Not really. She put straight pipes on it because she likes the noise. She hasn't had to put any other money into the thing. And I gotta say, I love it because it's got the six-speed transmission in it. No wimpy automatic for this lady. These basically are giant American go-karts with big v8 engines now this is the smaller v8 it's a 5.7 and of course small and large is relative it still puts out 350 horsepower you got the bigger one you'd have 402 horsepower but really in a vehicle of this size and weight 350 horsepower is going to get you where you're going awfully quick and she got a good deal because it was owned by an elderly man. That's what you want to get when you buy a Corvette. Unless it's me, in which case you wouldn't want to buy it. <laughs> now you can easily tell by the paint. This thing was garaged. It was his baby. They've got the certain style, but the main thing is they've got that sound. <laughs> I do have to say, if you notice closely, you can hear a little cutout. Well, that's the sad state of American society today. This thing got a rev limiter, and when she hit it, it started to cut itself down. I had the same thing happen to me when I was driving a 2013 Shelby Cobra GT500. I asked Ford, does it have a rev limiter? They said no. So I took it to the drag strip on a quarter mile, and I'm ringing it out in first gear, and it starts cutting out. And it got a horrible time. So finally, I got on the phone to Detroit and asked the engineers. They said, oh, yes, Scotty, it's got a rev limiter. We don't want people blowing the engines in those supercharged V8s with 667 horsepower. Now, as you can see over the years, they keep perfecting the design. They've got humongous disc brakes on it, front and back. I remember when I was a young mechanic in the 60s and I was working on a Stingray. We didn't know what disc brakes were, you know? We had to learn about it. <laughs> they were all drums. They were one of the first to go to disc brakes, which, of course, they all have now. And for you know, Northern boys, you like fiberglass because it doesn't rust. But if you are up north, be sure to check the frame. That's steel. You don't want to buy one with a rotten frame. Now you might think, okay, you can buy one of these. It's got to be a humongous gas hawk. Well, you might be surprised. Now, when I was a young mechanic, it was true because they had massive four barrel carburetors that just suck the gas on. Guys I know would get five, six miles a gallon. But with fuel injection and modern technology, you get about 17 when she's driving it in town and about 25 on a highway. There's an advantage to getting the smaller engine. If this was the 402 horsepower one, you'd get considerably worse gas mileage. And of course, if you had an automatic transmission, especially in town, you get a lot of worse. That's why the standard transmissions are really, they're more fun to drive, but they're also more economical. Because back in the day, standards did get a lot better gas mileage. Unlike modern cars that have such highly tuned automatic transmissions, some of them 10 speeds, that they'll get about the same gas mileage. It won't make any difference. But on these old ones, you're gonna get a lot better gas mileage with the standard. Plus you can do burnouts a lot easier too. <laughs> in any gear you want. Now this didn't come with this top. But guess what? She got it for $300 from a guy who didn't want one anymore. Now you might think it's only got 350 horsepower in it, but if you really want to roll along, just punch on it and watch what happens. It's a go kart for adults. You can have a lot of fun. It's still a very dependable vehicle. And really, for its age, doesn't have many clunks or anything. A couple of wind noise you're going to get in any older car, but hey, it's got a nice smooth ride for a car that's this fast. Pretty much racing stance on it for cornering. And this may be old, but it's still got active handling in it. And if you want to tempt fate, you can even turn the passenger airbag off. These things handle like a dream. <laughs> you 
can have a lot of fun with these things. Now a lot of people think, oh, it's so hard to drive a standard. The clutches are tough. It's hard to shift them. Well, in an old vet, yeah, a kid across the street had a 60s vet when I was a kid, a Stingray. And when you drove that thing, you almost had to use two feet on the clutch because it had a mechanical clutch and it was tough. You had to put your back against the bucket seat and push as hard as you could. Well, those days are long gone. Clutch completely hydraulic. Whee! Takes nothing to push it. Does not require a lot of energy. And the short shift, up, down. Not rocket science. Doesn't require Superman to shift it. Now, I do have to say, if you're learning to drive a car and you've never driven a car and you're learning on a standard transmission, okay, that's tough. You don't know what you're doing and then you got to put clutches and shifting. If you already know how to drive, I learned how to drive on a Chevy V8 automatic. I got a standard transmission Opal as my first car. Took me 10 minutes to figure out how to operate it. It's not complicated. Watch my video that I show how to drive a standard transmission car where I used a brand new Mazda Miata Grand Tour. It's very simple to learn to drive a standard if you already know how to drive. And really, it's a lot of fun. Not only is it fun driving around, but you can play with the sound more. It's an automatic, kind of boring, you know? It's just doing along this. You get to make the sound go up and down, rev it up at stoplights. You can have a lot of fun, and they are not that hard to learn. Don't ever let it put you off buying one of these things, because believe me, with the automatics, they're a lot more Boring. And it makes a big difference in the acceleration. I mean, it's got a big engine with an automatic. It's still a fast car, but it's a really fast car with a standard transmission. And that's what these things are all about. And don't think, oh, she just got lucky. I'll never get that lucky buying a car for that price that's in this shape. But believe it or not, there's a lot of older guys that own these things and they storm and take care of them. It's their babies. I had a grandfather. He never took his car out when it was raining. <laughs> Back in Buffalo, he kept it in the garage. If it was raining, he wouldn't even bring it out. He'd make him walk to the grocery store. <laughs> So if you want to have some low down fun for a little bit of money, you might look for one of these classic Corvettes that's been taken care of and you can pay a relatively low price for a really nice car that's got a lot of life left in it. And even though they don't make them like they used to, especially GM, they used to make them pretty good. Take advantage of that. And here's some bonus questions and answers. Stingray777 says, Scotty, I want to replace the fuel filter on my O2 Honda Accord. Do I need to replace the fuel filter and the strainer that looks like a tea bag? Do I change both? I think I just need a strainer. The fuel filter is part of the fuel pump assembly and the strainer's on the bottom. Now, unless you got crappy gas, those strainers generally will last forever. In the old days when you got bad gas, they'd clog up. On these, no, they generally don't have any problems at all. Now, you can get an aftermarket fuel fuel filter if you want to change your fuel filter and then you can take apart the fuel pump assembly and then put the filter on. That's what I would advise doing because it is a 2002. It's older. But I mean, what the heck? It's that old and you got to take the whole assembly out anyway. So if you can get the strainer, go ahead and buy a strainer. They don't cost much and replace them all because it's all in the gas tank. You got to take it all out anyways. At least it's a Honda. You don't have to drop the tank. You just take out the back seat, get to the access panel. The whole thing comes out and then you can replace the filter, which you can buy separately if you want. Honda only sells the whole fuel pump filter assembly. That's super expensive. You can just get an aftermarket filter, put it on. You might as well get a strainer. What the heck? You're doing all that work. Why bother not to? Although it probably doesn't need one. 1990 Cat says, what's the best battery for a 2016 Toyota Tundra that's in cold climate? Not the cheapest, but the best for service and warranty if needed. All right. There's zillions of batteries out there. And hilariously enough, there's only a handful of places that actually manufacture batteries. Then they build them for other people. Take Toyota, for example. They don't make make their own batteries. They buy them from some other company. From my own personal experience, the AutoZone ones are pretty good. There's AutoZones everywhere. They're real good. If you get one that's got like a three-year free replacement, it goes bad the first three years. They give you a new one. No question, no charge. They have a very good policy and they're very good batteries. Now, they used to be made by Johnson Controls, which is a big company. Maybe they still are. I don't know. They might have changed. It's a huge company. Plus, this is what you want to understand about batteries. You want to buy them in a place that sells a lot of batteries because when I was young, the batteries came vacuum sealed, nothing in them. You'd break the seals, fill them with acid and charge them up at the gas station and then you'd sell them to the people. My father ran a gas station. Today they're built at the factory sealed with acid and out they go. They start to degrade. So you don't want to buy a battery that's more than a month or two old max because they degrade just sitting there on a shelf. So if you go to some place that doesn't sell much batteries, if it's six or nine months old and you buy it, it may have lost 30, 40 to 50 percent of its lifespan already just sitting there. Where the auto zones, they sell a lot of batteries, so they're fresh batteries. Always look at the date. It'll say like 
320, which would be January, February, March of 2020. You want to learn how to read it. And if you can't ask them, when was it made by law? They have to tell you. You want a fresh battery when you buy it. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.